Our next speaker, Fiziri Nahiro, fled the Congo in 2005 with his family. Fluent in six languages, Fiziri worked as an interpreter for numerous refugee agencies. After spending eight years in a resettlement camp, Fiziri and his family arrived in Rochester in September 2011. He graduated from MCC in 2016. Faziri works at the Francis Center, a men's shelter, is the founder of Rochester Global Refugee Services and coordinates the local UN World Refugee Day, which is coming up in Rochester on June 20th. I never dream small, he says. If you dream small, you do small. Please join me in welcoming Faziri here today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, as they have said, I was, I'm a former refugee, that's how I call myself. Being in America, I feel like I'm a part of America. So, it, I, I normally watch some of the movies, uh, it's kind of funny, but there is some movies that are alien movies, right? I hope everybody have seen it, but aliens are... Oh, okay, I'm kind of tall, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, alien movies, when I... I watch those movies and I thought of how they call refugees or people from other countries, they are aliens, right? But I tried to find the meaning or definition of that word. It's people who doesn't have where they come from, right? But I do have a where I come from, even if I'm a refugee. I do co I come from Congo and I'm proud of being from Congo. I'm proud of being from Africa. <laughs> As, uh, as you've heard in news, our president mentioned something about us or whatever it is. Uh, but I don't consider my country like that. I don't consider Africa like that or any other country, including America. We are all in the world and we all share humanity as one identity. Doesn't matter where you come from. I'm speaking on behalf of Rochester Global Refugee Services. And we're here not only to work with refugees, but also Americans to try to bring inclusion between Americans and refugees from all over the, the world. So our purpose is not building division, racism, or any other thing, but bringing people together and sharing love. Learn from each other, learn other cultures, learn other languages. It's not because you speak different language or you were born somewhere, then you are from somewhere or you are not welcome here. We are all immigrants and refugees, which makes us one identity of a human being. Dep depending on where you come from, it makes a difference. We are all working together and sharing the common goals and mission to build this country. So I heard that they are trying to bring in people who can contribute to this country. I hope I'm part of the people who contribute to this country, as any other refugee or immigrant. It doesn't matter where you come from. You come here, you get a job, you work, you pay taxes, you pay housing, you do anything else that other Americans are doing. So which means I contribute to this country. I'm part of building this country. Yes. The reason I'm saying this, I've had people telling me, hey, why are you here? You should go back to your country. This is our world, not your world. And I ask, what is your world? What do you mean, what do you defi define your world as? Where you standing right now, or where you belong? Because where we all belong in the world, doesn't matter where you're standing, but where you are, it means that you are in the world. We don't have two worlds, right? So it doesn't matter where you come from, but we are all in this, under the sun. So which means we are all where we are. If I'm in America, I'm in America. Consider me as an American. The issue that we've had about refugees, I know we've uh, uh, limited the number of refugees who should come in, but remember that all refugees who are in refugee camps depend on you. Your voice, they are in refugee camp, they don't have a voice. Maybe if they could be here, they will tell you the stories why they come here. I never meant, meant to come here. I never chose to come here. I had my country and I was proud of being in my country, but I was forced to leave my country. So if I'm here, Consider me as an American because I'm part of this country community. So I'm part of it. Consider me as an American. I do as any anything else that an American does. So I'm arguing you to speak to your representative. Please speak on behalf of refugees who are all over the world. It doesn't matter if you are Muslim or Christian. We are all human beings. Probably, I don't know how to mention this, but if we 
see someone who does something wrong, we don't have to make it general to everyone else. If a Muslim person commits suicide or bombs or whatever it is, it's not all Muslims. There is many Muslims who are contributing to this country, who are fighting the terrorism together with Americans. So it's you and me, on behalf of those who are being segregated, dis discriminated, to speak on their behalf. It's a part of our, our culture. As Americans, as immigrants, as Americans who are now fighting for the truth and the rights of everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiziri. Our next two speakers, Kendall Bell and Shelley Clements. Kendall Bell joins us today representing the Federation of Social Workers. Shelly Clements represents the NYSUT, the New York State United Teachers Union. Both of these women are very involved in the labor movement and will be speaking about labor and unions. Please welcome Kendall and Shelly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kendall Bell, and I'm the president of the Federation of Social Workers. When I was asked to speak today, I wanted to know what the theme was. Then I thought about it, I'm like, duh, this is Women's March 2.0. One year ago this month, I was walking with my union sisters and brothers in Washington, D.C. to protest the unimaginable. On election night 2016, I went to bed hopeful and woke up the next morning in disbelief. I admit when I woke up on November 9, 2016, I closed my eyes and I tried to wish the horrible news away. I asked myself, what does this mean for myself and my three daughters? Knowing the evil sentiments spewed during the campaign, I was afraid for them. My daughters are 23, 21, and 17, all confident young women whom I've carefully prepared to navigate this thing called life. Despite my best efforts to prepare them for success, all I could think of was the hatred that had been unleashed and allowed to fester, waiting to attack them when least expected, and rob them of opportunities that should be theirs as young women growing and building their lives. In time, I realized that we couldn't just sit back and wait for this to pass. This anger and frustration needed to be constructively channeled to yield positive results. As a woman in the labor movement, I understand what it means to fight for what's right and just. Labor has a long history intertwined with civil rights and politics, as we can see by the emergence of constituency groups like the Coalition of Labor Union Women, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, and Pride at Work. Here in Rochester, these groups are coming together against this direct attack on women, supporting voter literacy and voter registration efforts. Nationally, there are now over 600 women who are likely to run for political office during this election cycle. More than 26,000 women have reached out to EMILY's list about running since November 2016. As we all know, hell hath no fury like that of a woman scorned. <laughs> Or in this case, grabbed, objectified, and belittled. <laughs> My union, the Communication Workers of America, developed the CWA Women's Political Power Program to encourage and groom women to enter the political arena. Whether it be as a candidate or working on a campaign, the emphasis is on keeping women in the forefront to change the narrative and give women the power to make the decisions that impact them, as well as the rest of the community, locally, nationally, and globally. Yeah. Gone are the times when women stayed in the background. Women are empowered more now than ever to be the change makers and reset the course. We're a force to be reckoned with, reclaiming our time, as evidenced by sisters like U.S. Senator Kamala Harris, U.S. Representative Maxine Waters, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, and our very own Mayor Lovely Warren. As evidenced today, there isn't much that can hold us back. Now that we've decided this is our time, it's on. Yeah. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said, women belong in all the places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> is labor in the park? Labor! Labor's in the park. When we stand together, we make change happen. The police court was well attended yesterday morning. 
Among other cases disposed of were those against Matilda Crawford, Sally Bell, Carrie Jones, Dora Jones, Ophelia Turner, and Sarah A. Collier. The sextet of Ebony Hugh damsels was charged with disorderly conduct and quarreling, and in each case, except the last, a fine of $5 was imposed and subsequently paid. So read the July 29, 1881 edition of the Atlanta Constitution newspaper. <laughs> you see, each one of these cases was the result of the Atlanta washerwoman's strike. Yeah. yeah. In July of 1881, a group of 20 laundresses met in a church, not unlike these around here in Summer Hill, to form a trade labor organization the Washing Society. They sought higher pay, respect, and autonomy over their work. Now just so that you understand what their work was, washerwomen worked long and hard for pay that ranged from four to eight dollars a month. For four to eight dollars a month, they, they made their own soap from lye, they made their own starch from wheat bran. They made their own wash tubs from beer barrels that they cut in half. They had to gather wood to feed the fires that heated the water that they had to carry in from wells and from ponds in order to boil, wash, and then rinse the heavy bundles of clothes, linens, and diapers that they had to walk several miles to pick up and then several miles to take back. Okay, back to the meeting. This group of 20 laundresses, the Washing Society, sought higher pay for their labor. They established a uniform pay rate, the whopping pay of $1 per dozen pounds of wash. This was a significant increase from their $4 to $8 a month. They announced that their membership would strike if they weren't given the uniform rate. They understood that when we stand together, we can make change happen. Yeah. Yeah. The Washing Society, or the Washing Amazons, as their opponents called them, established door-to-door -door canvassing to build their ranks and widen their membership, urging laundress laundresses across the city to join or to honor their strike. They also used church meetings to spread the word and to organize to get community support. Seeking solidarity among washerwomen, they also involved white laundresses who were less than 2% of the laundresses in the city at that time, an extraordinary sign of interracial solidarity for 1881. Because they understood that when we stand together, we make change happen. It was during the canvassing that that sextet of Ebony Hugh damsels were arrested and charged with disorderly conduct. As a result of the canvassing, within three weeks of its formation, the Washing Society grew from 20 people to 3,000 people. When the Washing Society held their mass meeting and called a strike to end, excuse me, called a strike to achieve higher pay at the uniform rate, they were 3,000 strong. Woo! Because when we stand together, we can make change happen. As you can imagine, this demand for higher wages was warmly received by the authorities in Atlanta. Not really. The authorities began arresting and firing and fining the striking workers, and the city council proposed imposing a $25 fee on anybody who joined the organization. They even offered tax breaks to businesses who expressed a willingness to start commercial steam laundries. That sound familiar? Tax breaks to businesses, to weekend unions. Yeah. Do you know how the society responded? Even though $25 was an, an amount that was equal to several months of pay, they sent a letter to city council with this message, and I paraphrase, we 
are determined to stand to our pledge and we have agreed and are willing to pay your stinking $25 stinking is my word stinking $25 for licenses as a protection so that we can control the washing for the city and we'll do it before we will be defeated and then we will have full control of the city's washings at our own prices. We hope to hear from your council Tuesday morning. <laughs> we mean business this week or no washing. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure that if they had a mic, they would have dropped it and walked out of the room. <laughs> the washerwomen's defiance, plus the growing support for the strike because cooks, house servants, and nurses started following suit. They were like, hey, we can get more money. This looks like it may work. Plus the growing piles of dirty laundry <laughs> forced the city council to withdraw its licensing threat. The women achieved an improvement in their rate and called off the strike. Because when we stand together, we can make change happen. There are similarities between the laundresses of 1881 and today's low-wage workers who are neglected and disrespected by the 1%. Hopefully, these workers, many of whom are women, can be motivated by these black women, motivated by their courageousness, their resolve in the face of the arrest, the fines and the fees, motivated, motivated by the success by those who stood together and refused to give up until they won respect and better compensation for their work. Motivated by these black women who realized that union membership gave them strength in numbers because when we stand together, we can make change happen. Thank you.